Hello, everyone, and welcome to Talking Insights uh, from SMR. We are welcoming you from, uh, from Amsterdam, from the city where SMR is actually located, uh, where we are also celebrating our annual Congress. Uh, I have the pleasure to have with me one of the, uh, of the speakers uh, in this, uh, um, in, in this um, uh, event. I have with me uh, Maria uh, Bruder. Uh, hi, welcome. Hello, thank you for having me. <laughs> it's great to have you here. Um, and uh, well, I think you will be talking tomorrow, right? Yeah. Uh, so uh, let's, well, we will go a little bit through everything that uh, you will be covering. Um, I will try, I'll try not, not to go too much into detail, you know, so like to leave a bit of the suspense and a bit of the anticipation for tomorrow. But I would like to invite you to, uh, to present yourself, to um, explain a bit uh, what is your role, uh, well, uh, the, the BBC, what, what the, the company you work for, uh, in what area uh, you work, and a bit more of yourself. Okay, great. Uh, yeah, so my name is Maria. I am a researcher with the BBC World Service, which is a little bit separate to BBC UK. So BBC UK has a lot of insight teams that deal specifically with all of its different entities, whereas the World Service has one insight team that deals with everything. For those of people who don't know, the World Service uh, includes the World News TV channel that most people are familiar with because it's on all of the like hotel rooms around the world, and the World Service English Radio. But then we also have services in over 40 um, local languages, which can broadcast across TV, radio, and then all of them have digital sites and social media. So our insight team deals with uh, all of that, basically, and that can cover measurement, digital measurement tracking, brand tracking, um, audience measurement. So every year we do a big study that tracks BBC reach globally, uh, which includes uh, modeling from previous surveys, but then also new surveys in each of our major markets. And then we also do more kind of behavioral studies that look at the social importance of news, changing media landscapes, changing behaviors, um, perceptions of the BBC in the different markets that we are mm -hmm. uh, operating. So it's quite varied. It's yeah. a lot. Um, it covers a lot of different methodologies and it's really interesting. Yeah, I mean, it's quite a, I, I can only imagine also the, the, um, the responsibility of the, of the task to keep, to keep track on probably one of the most well-recognized um, news brands out there. It's uh, and especially also uh, well-regarded too. So. Yeah, depending where you are. Depending where you are, I suppose. <laughs> yeah, which is also, again, one of the importance of brand tracking to see how that goes, because it's actually what um, we were talking about last year in SMR about brand tracking and uh, the fact that because the news cycle changes so quickly mm -hmm. and so unpredictably sometimes that it's really important to keep on top of what your brand proposition is and your perceptions are in markets because it can change very quickly depending on what is happening in the world. Okay. May, may I ask if it's if it's important to to state uh, the, the the brand positioning for um, as well, especially for a news uh, for a news channel? Is it is it important to uh, uh, say to remind the audience where you stand, what what the, the values are, if there is if there are changes or? Yeah, I mean, so the proposition for the BBC uh, in general and the World Service has remained fairly consistent um, in that we want to provide trusted and independent news to as many people as possible and help them understand the world around them. Mm -hmm. And that includes underserved audiences, includes younger audiences, people in um, areas of low press media freedom. They're actually one of our kind of main targets to ensure that they have access continually to unbiased, objective news when they need it. Um, and like, we're very open about that, but mm -hmm. obviously, depending on where you are in some markets and that market's history with Britain, mm -hmm. basically, it's going to um, color your perception of the BBC, Absolutely. especially in terms of if the BBC is covering stories in your market that can also, you know, raise kind of um, questions around how impartial we are. Exactly. No, I can I can imagine. And I can imagine you can you can never aim to satisfy absolutely everybody. There are, you, you will always find uh, voices that are of dissent. Um, so if, if you were to summarize in a, in a few sentences what uh, tomorrow's uh, topic is going to be uh, in, in your session. Yeah, sure. So it is an ongoing project that has been a priority for the business for a long time. Mm -hmm. And we finally managed to bring it all together in one cohesive approach, which is about tackling the gap in gender consumption. So our research shows continually that we reach more men on a global level uh, than women. 
And again, going back to the earlier point, we want to make sure that we're reaching all audiences. All audiences deserve to have access to trusted, independent news uh, that empowers them, helps them take control of what's going on, gives them better understanding. So this is not something that was sitting right with us and we wanted to improve our reach with women, clearly we're not doing enough to serve this audience. And so the research, uh, the presentation tomorrow covers the main findings from this research. Okay. is that I can imagine that also like th this research, especially such an, in, in such an international scope, on such a large demographic, it, like I, I can only imagine what the, I don't know, like the, the, the differences mm -hmm. of, um, I mean, because I, I was tempted to ask, did you did you find find out the why? Why is it that women may not be consuming um, 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 news as much as men in many of, of of the countries? And I, as 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 I, as I was about to say this, I just started thinking like, this is impossible to to answer to. <laughs> Well, actually, you have touched on um, one of the key findings of the report, which is that there is an issue with the very question itself, uh, because women are not a monolith. You know, they're exactly. not homogenous. It's very dependent on lifestyle and late, well, life stages, circumstances. It's going to be different in different markets. And as we um, went through the research in the different stages, particularly when we started doing uh, more uh, sophisticated data science on our uh, data sets, it became clear that it was much more about other factors than just gender. Um, but there are also, to come to the earlier point around what's in our control and what's not in our control, there is still the legacy of patriarchy in a lot of the markets that exactly. we operate in, um, especially the ones where we have some of our highest reach. Uh, and that is going to negatively impact women much more so than men. And that is something that has an impact on news consumption down the line too. So that's important to recognize. Mm -hmm. But we still saw um, a gap in gender consumption even in more developed markets. It exists in the UK, it exists in the US. And so it's important to understand why that was as well. Could, so it's a real mixture of factors. Do you think it could have basic, well, I'm trying to simplify a little bit, but, <laughs> but do you think it could have the same underlying reason? At the end of the day, you know, you can say, or I, 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 um, I think that I would say that uh, countries like the US, the UK, they are still, uh, but, uh, but Absolutely. Uh, the patriarchy still is. Uh, it's kind of seen, and it's been um, talked about in other like external literature as well. So it's nothing new, but basically our data confirmed the fact that it still exists, what we were calling structural barriers, which are the more kind of um, like barriers towards education and employment or healthcare, et cetera. But then something that was called mindset barriers, which are more conceptual, which is about gendered social norms. And there is a gendered social norm index report, which is separate to this. We didn't do it, but it's brilliant if you have the chance to look into it, which is talking around, for instance, um, the expectation of women to do the bulk of childcare sure. and domestic labor. And that's still very much prevalent, even in like, you know, Anglophone or Western or European markets, and has actually been exacerbated in the wake of things like the pandemic, where we saw that, you know, lockdown actually caused more of these norms to reassert themselves and women being pushed back into this role. Sure. And there's lots of studies that show that uh, even if you're still a woman who's working full time as much as your partner, you're still expected to spend a lot more time on unpaid domestic labor through, you know, chores, laundry, cooking, childcare, the emotional burden that's also associated with this. There's a really good study in the UK that was talking specifically around news avoidance in women. And they found that that was connected to the additional emotional burden related to the fact that they're expected to do the bulk of childcare and caring for extended family members. And because of that, they offloaded the kind of the mental effort of negative news to uh, their male partner who was doing less of that. And so it was almost a division of labor to be able to um, save their own mental health. All right. So basically it was, it was a choice to avoid consuming news because Which oftentimes to... are exactly. Yeah, yeah. And they already had too much of the emotional labor connected with things like childcare. Wow. So it's like the mental capacity is kind of at, yes. uh, well, full, essentially. And sure. so you offload it to um, your partner who is not dealing with that. Okay. So I, I see like a, a lot of, um, of these topics are actually, um, they touch on either stereotypes or, 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 or cultural um, um, 
part of the cultural establishment, right? It, this is not something that I can imagine that you expect to change, or definitely not uh, mm -hmm. overnight. Uh, how, as a, as a company, you're trying to reach uh, to this demographic, what are, or if you can give some of the examples of how else you can uh, reach this demographic, um, while understanding all, all, all these cultural nuances. Well, it's interesting that you ask this because we're going to start the presentation tomorrow with a bit of an interactive element. But what it's trying to do is to sh um, show that in order to answer that question and find out what we need to do, you do need to challenge existing stereotypes. Mm -hmm. You need to find out what they are and then challenge them to see if they're true or false, which is one of the main reasons for this research, actually. And these assumptions are internal because, again, we're talking about the world service. It is massive. It is over 40 languages. It operates in many countries. All of those languages have their own bureau or their own um, you know, team of editors and journalists, some of them who've been working for decades and have you know, their own thoughts about why we're not reaching women or how to reach women. Mm -hmm. And because, again, it can be difficult to localize all this knowledge, uh, you have all of these multiple internal efforts going on over time to try and address the problem. Some work, some doesn't work. People don't know why it doesn't work. The stereotypes are at play again. And we have a list of stereotypes in the presentation that we then kind of debunk a little bit later on. But that's one of the key steps first is to identify almost like uh, the mindset barriers again. Exactly. Before you can actually address what needs to be done. Exactly. To, to basically to really have a, a clear image of what you have ahead, what, what, what the challenge really is, right? Yeah, because if yes. people have a stereotype or a thing in mind of like, well, this is never going to work because of X, then you can bring findings and it's not going to stick. It's not going to drive change Actually. because it hasn't, you haven't actually addressed um, the barrier that people have been holding on to. So like, for instance, one of them is that women are just not interested in politics. You know, we've heard this from people and teams saying, well, we're never going to be able to achieve better reach because we do a lot of politics content and it's just women don't care. So it's important to know that, you know, so that we can then address that and trying to actually use the research to address it properly. It is funny. That sounds a little bit like a, like a lazy excuse to me. <laughs> you know, but like it's, it's one that you see if you, for instance, if you look at the tracking data and go, oh, politics doesn't do well. Or like if you, you know, do a survey or something without digging into it, which is one of the reasons why we did mixed methods to actually compare um, claimed data with, you know, actual ethnographic and understanding what people are talking about and using um, in-depth interviews to get into it a little mm -hmm. bit more, we can understand of like, okay, so politics means different things. There's politics, which exists in the sphere of government and politicians, but then there's politics in terms of like local policy that, you know, affects every day, in terms of education, strikes, yeah. or, you know, um, local council, whatever, that lots of women are very, um, interested in and feel a strong need to keep up to date with or whatever but they wouldn't necessarily call it politics yeah so there's actually like a perception barrier even in the mind of the audience yeah i see i see but what, what, what i get the sense as well is that in order to um in, in order to really assess this problem you, you you sort of had to start with a blank page get all these prejudices aside then see which ones really exist and then uh, continue with the with the research, right? Like yeah. there must be a huge, well, set of preconceptions that we that we exactly. could begin with. It was important to understand the preconceptions, and we go again in the presentation. We've got all of the kind of the order of what we did, existing literature to understand where the gaps are in studies that have been done previously, and then again the point of doing the qual, the ethnography, was to really just kind of allow women almost to speak for themselves or their behavior to speak for themselves without us immediately drawing up a survey with our own hypotheses. Yep. So you do the qual first, you do the ethnography, you do the interviews, and then from that you do the analysis, create hypotheses based of it and scale it in a survey. And that was really important to follow that step. Okay, okay. A small question out of curiosity as well. Um, in in your studies, you you like you say you found basically um, lower consumption uh, of news from women, more or less ac across the ac across the globe. Basically, um, did you also find it uh, across all um, age groups? Well, again, that's interesting. And we would say also to go back to the first point of the sentence: um, lower the men across all regions. 
relative to the news consumption of men in that region, because you may have much higher news consumption, for instance, let's say in the US. Mm. And so women in the US will also have much higher news consumption than women somewhere else. But again, relative to the men in that region, it will be a bit lower. So one of the things that we go into is, again, less about gender and more about life stage and circumstance. And it also applies to age as well. So for instance, it's interesting, one of the most the groups that has the most kind of a level news consumption behavior are students. Because at that time, you were probably at your most level in terms of life stage as well. You haven't had kids yet. You don't have like as many domestic responsibilities, similar age, maybe at uni. And we see actually almost level news consumption within this group. And then as life continues and you get more responsibilities, things start to change a little bit. I see. I see. And um, I guess as Part of the of the findings or part of the proposals or the recommendations that you may have uh, given to, uh, to like to your stakeholders to the to the company, could you or, or did you find perhaps that there was a more effective way of reaching to some of these groups? So, so for example, maybe some groups w uh, would consume more. Imagine visual content, uh, shorter videos, because perhaps that is what they can consume. What you were saying, uh, some some. Uh, uh, some lifestyles, they already have too much in their heads. They they cannot just consume an entire newspaper of negative news because that would be overwhelming. Yeah. But maybe like shorter videos in which they are like, okay, fine. Got the, 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 the idea. Um, yeah, definitely. I mean, platform um, and format mm -hmm. definitely form part of our recommendations and also the concept of time mm -hmm. because almost all of our groups feel that they're pressed for time men as well as women feel that maybe um, news is more of a chore rather than an enjoyment. Uh, but the news needs to fit into their daily schedule. And we also know that there are particular times of day where people are more likely to consume one type of news versus another. Mm -hmm. So you might be scrolling on social, you know, during the day on work or like, you know, just scanning the headlines, but you might watch a longer documentary in the evening or, uh, you know, read a long read. But then, the frame of mind and the emotional need comes into play where we have people saying, well, I'm not going to consume negative news before I go to bed, you know, because I want to sleep well. So when's the right time for that kind of news? Mm. And yeah, it plays a part. And again, it's different depending on your audience group. So students can be a bit more receptive to some things because they have some of them the easiest lifestyle. Again, they have the least responsibilities, whereas working families, you know, parents who are running around with their kids and also balancing a full time job. They can consume news on lots of different platforms, but a much shorter time period. So yeah. what do they need? Yeah, you know? exactly. Well, this is uh, actually, it, it, it looks actually like such a massive, massive study. It because, kept growing. Yeah. The scope it's kept a, growing as we were doing it, yeah. It is, what, what, what do you say? I mean, at the end of the day, you are basically studying uh, an entire half of the planet. <laughs> and as, as you were saying, it's not a monolithic uh, concept. Um, like, by dividing by geography, by age, by however you want socioeconomic sta status and everything, it could, could have given you, I can only imagine the, the trove of uh, of data and, uh, and information and insights that you could have uh, ex extracted from that. So it's, yeah, it's, uh, it's ongoing. Um, it's been a long process. I think pretty much everyone in the team has been involved mm -hmm. at some point. I only joined the BBC halfway through the project. So the qual was already done when I came in and then I was more dealing with the quant. Um, but yeah, it's been really interesting as well to finally bring in a lot of the data sets that we had already. Mm -hmm. So as well in the presentation tomorrow, we'll look into the digital content analysis that was done. So all of the um, content produced across different topics, all the different languages, and then where we have gender-based data, being able to kind of code them by themes and by treatment to be able to see what actually works with women and give that information, which is really quite actionable mm -hmm. to our editorial team, and then match it back to the ethnographer that we were doing in the survey to kind of create a holistic picture it's been quite exciting yeah yeah quite a uh, quite a task at hand <laughs> I'm <gonna> say. <laughs> interesting one and a yeah. good one to do yeah no oh, very interesting well uh thank, thank you so much uh, maria for being here it's been a it's been a pleasure i actually um i really hope to uh, to find the time to yeah, <laughs> uh, to, to see the presentation tomorrow uh, for those uh, of well, those who are not here um, after Congress, um, I, I'm pretty sure that the presentation is going to be recorded. We'll um, uh, we'll process it and we will uh, 
uh, we will place it uh, in SMR's repository in ANA, so we, uh, SMR members will be able to find the presentation online. Uh, other than that, uh, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Yes. And uh, to everybody else, thank you for uh, tuning in. I hope you find it uh, just as interesting. We will continue with other sessions of uh, Talking Insights throughout these days at our uh, SMR uh, Congress here in Amsterdam. Thank you so much, and I'll see you next time.